Hi, my name is Mesa Salida, and I love all things science. Did you know there's science everywhere? We're surrounded by it. But what is it? What does science in action look like? Today, we're going to learn about the wonderful world of reptiles and amphibians. We'll meet with scientists and understand what they're learning by studying these creatures and in turn, what they can teach us about our relation to the environment. This is Surrounded by Science. A lot of energy in that little gummy bear. Reptiles are some of the oldest species around. The earliest known proto-reptiles originated around 310 million years ago. What can we learn from these amazing animals? I met with Justine Labello with the Georgia Reptile Society to learn more. Hi, so we're here today to learn all about reptiles. Now, we're not at the zoo, we are at the home of the founder of the Georgia Reptile Society, Justine Labello, and she has over 40 animals inside her house. And I wanna know why, how? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I've been keeping reptiles since I was a little girl, and I got my first snake when I was 16 years old. And uh, I've always gone to reptile shows and seen the community and then seen some of the laws that have been passing um, regarding reptile ownership. And one of the concerning things that people don't consider is that um, affecting reptile ownership can also affect uh, captive breeding efforts uh, for species that are very rare that zoos and other government institutions may not be concentrating on. So John and I, my husband, uh, started the Georgia Reptile Society about five years ago uh, to start more like a boots on the ground education effort Mm -hmm. uh, for regular people who aren't attending like a science event. We go to Renaissance Festival and other conventions and uh, we bring the animals to them and we think it's very important that people have that hands-on interaction with the animal. So what kind of animals do you have now? We have a lot. We have over 40 animals, boas, pythons, turtles, tortoises. And, and, and there's, there's, there's one coming yeah, up here right now. This is Brownie. Uh, hey Brownie, come over here. Brownie is a leopard tortoise. She's 20 years old, but she'll live to be over 100. Wow, and how much does Brownie weigh? Brownie uh, weighs about 35 pounds right now, and uh, she's munching on some sweet potatoes. <laughs> uh, they're really attracted to colors, so. Am I allowed to touch her? Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Can she feel this? She can. Uh, their shells are made of keratin, the same thing that your nails and hair are made out of. And between these scutes, there's layers of skin. So they can feel all of this. It's not the same feeling as like touching skin, mm -hmm. but they definitely know you're touching them. And, and what is, these are just scales she has on her? Yeah, so her feet are actually armored with these really um, sharp scales and they can't close their shell like a box turtle. So they actually put their feet in front of their face okay. to protect themselves from predators. And those scales are very hard and uh, hard to get through, so. Yeah, this is a massive amount of protection. Uh, mm -hmm. What is she so worried about? <laughs> well, uh, they come from Central Africa, and so they have to live amongst lions, uh, hyenas, uh, wild dogs, and the sort. Um, so that's, they need this armor to protect themselves. And they actually do pretty good. Most of those predators don't go for them because it's not an easy meal. Um, to get into a tortoise. Hi. So her shell is really cool. Um, you know, it's obviously very good protection for her, but uh, one thing you'll notice is that she has these pyramids going on, and this is actually not natural in the wild. They're very smooth. Uh, in captivity though, if they're fed too much protein or they have too little humidity as they're growing, they can form these pyramids in their shell, uh, which isn't necessarily super healthy, but at this instance, it's not that bad. It's not that severe. Um, if it gets too severe, it can cause a lot of issues with the shell. It can actually be like a, a cavity in your tooth. Uh, it'll get into the shell scutes and it can cause pain. Uh, so. It's uh, one thing that we always tell people who are getting baby tortoises to make sure they get their care requirements right from the beginning because it can affect them later in life. Oh, she likes my nails. Yes, she'll try <laughs> to eat your nails because <laughs> they're nice and pink. So she thinks they're a fruit. <laughs> and what's her favorite food? Her favorite thing ever is tomatoes. Tomatoes are her favorite. Here, scratch her back. Scratch her right there. <laughs> she does this little shake. We need to scratch funny. her. 
That's so funny. Well, this is awesome. I'd love to see more. Sure, yeah. Okay. Let's go inside and take a look. Okay, all right, great. Justine was not kidding. As founder of the Georgia Reptile Society, she has a lot of pets. And here are just a few of them. Know your reptiles. Box turtle, Burmese brown mountain tortoise, Chinese box turtle, Northern banded water snake, Kenyan sand boa, corn snake, Egyptian Euromastix. All right, here's the uh, Reptile room. Oh my gosh, you weren't kidding. <laughs> there are a lot of animals in here. Yeah. This is your uh, biggest cage here. Cage? Yeah, enclosure. Okay. Enclosure, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, what do we have in here? This is Phil. He's a rhinoceros iguana ah. from the Dominican Republic. I'm well, going to go ahead and get him out real quick for okay, you cool. so you can interact with him. So, as I was saying before, we uh, like people to interact with our animals so that they can feel a closer connection to them. And Phil is no exception. I'm gonna put him on you. Oh, oh, he wants mommy. I know. <laughs> Can I touch him? Yes, absolutely. Oh wow, he's his skin is really kind of rough in one direction and yeah. looks sandpapery and then smooth the other. Many reptiles have scales that go one direction. Uh, most of the time, when you try to put them backwards, you're gonna get caught up in it. Um, and but. what's this uh, almost fake eye? He has on the side of his head? Oh, this is actually his ear. Uh, oh, lizards really? do have ears, yeah. They um, oh, wow. have an internal ear, but you can see um, basically the membrane for the ear on the outside. That's really cool. And I've heard that lizards will regrow their tails. As Some species will. Um, rhinoceros iguanas, I'm not sure. I do know that green iguanas do regrow their tails. <laughs> he likes my hair. <laughs> He's called a rhino iguana because if you look at the top of his head, he's got those little horns. A little horn, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And does he show affection in any way? You know, reptiles don't have the capacity for affection like a mammal would, uh, but he definitely uh, knows who I am, and he's not afraid of people. And uh, he enjoys being held from time to time, and he likes getting up on people's shoulders. So um, I'd say he's pretty happy right here. And reptiles, lizards included, of course, are uh, cold-blooded animals. That's right. correct, yeah. I have to keep him pretty warm, actually. His heat lamp gets about 120 degrees in the hottest spot, so. And is he inactive when he's cold? How does, yeah, how does he, the- Yeah, they're very work? lethargic, and basically all they want to do is either sleep or seek heat out. Uh, so they, it definitely shuts down their metabolism, and they do change in their personality when they're cold versus when they're warm. And that's the way all reptiles are? Pretty much every reptile is like that. So this room must be quite warm. Yeah, the, the ambient temperature in here is anywhere from 80 to 85 degrees during the day. At night, it drops to about 70 degrees. Wow. And you have more than just him, I see. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Actually, what I'm going to do is open the enclosure beneath him, and we're going to walk to this other side and uh, give her a chance to come out. We'll come back around. OK, well, I'm All excited right. about that. Can I Great. help you open this? What are you taking me to see here? This is a lizard over here I want to show you. Wait, this looks like a snake. Well, it actually is a lizard. It just doesn't have any legs. It's a legless lizard. Doesn't a legless lizard mean basically a snake? <laughs> no, actually. Um, the big difference between him and a snake is that he actually blinks his eyes. Uh, he also chews his food, and he has two long lungs instead of one long lung and one really short, almost oh, vestigial huh. lung. So um, it's all kind of on the inside. Yeah, it's all on the inside. But you know, of course, you can look at his face and see that he has a lizard face, but he has a snake. Let's body. see it. Can you? Yeah, can you bring sure. Him out? Let me get him out. So. Um, this is a European glass lizard, oh, the species. He's, uh, perky. Yeah, he's a little bit active when I get him out. But, okay. And he is gonna he's gonna make some odd movements, but Oh yeah, you're right. He has kind of like a pointed yeah. nose and teeth. Uh, yeah, he has little teeth. It's okay. He won't he won't bite you. Oh, I'm sure he won't. It's all right. So <laughs> one of the things about legless lizards is they're very awkward uh, because they don't yeah, have- Yeah, well, they don't have legs. <laughs> they don't have legs, and they also don't have those really cool muscles on their ventral scales. So they kind of push themselves forward. So when you hold one, they kind of do that. No, it's okay, buddy. I know, I know. And I just and try is to this move a, a Is this a, 
a precursor to a snake or was this like some you know path they, of the they evolution? split off yeah they split off and what's funny is it's almost like they're right in between uh they do actually have a very slight fork to their tongue but it's not like a snake's tongue um, and then of course they're legless. Uh, so there's a lot about them that is just really cool. Like they're the middle ground between snakes and lizards. And um, is there any like spot on his underside that shows like where the legs would have been? If yeah, I... actually, if you look uh, right there towards his ventral area. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, there, I see that. There's little, um, they're very, very tiny, but actually in there, there's little itty bitty like yeah. spikes. I yeah, can yeah, hardly no, no. see it. There see it is it. on my I nail. See it. Very tiny. Um, but they, they uh, at one time had legs. Wow. And so this species is native to Europe, you said? Yes. Um, they, they're called Russian glass lizards, European glass lizards, or also known as a sheltopusik, <laughs> which I like to call them. Uh, but they're really intelligent animals. And uh, yeah, he is just not a big fan of being held, I know. All right, well, let's, let's not stress him out All too right. much, but we've got, a, we've got two lizards so far that we've so seen. So far we've um, seen two lizards. Let's go look at a snake next. Okay, all right, cool. Earlier in the show, I met Justine Labello, who's the founder of the Georgia Reptile Society, which aims to inform the public about the importance of reptiles. Justine cares for a large variety of animals. Here are a few more of them. European glass lizard, western hognose, ball python, rhinoceros iguana, diamondback terrapin, gopher tortoise, hissing cockroach. And there was one animal in particular that I don't think I was quite ready to meet. Burmese python, whoa. <laughs> This so thing is enormous. I'm also gonna need my uh, friend Matt's help to pick her up. Okay. She's so big. How much does she weigh? She's about 60 pounds. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Matt, come on. <laughs> come on. <laughs> you got it. Here. Uh, oh my gosh. She's really heavy. Really heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You got oh her. God, it doesn't even. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is Paula Dean. It's a Burmese see. python. I see how these things can constrict you. Yeah. She's very large. <laughs> Um, she's about six years old wow. and uh, she is 10 feet long, weighs 60 pounds, like I said before. Um, these guys are from Burma and that's like Burmese python. Um, and albinos are not a natural color. This is actually bred in captivity to be this color. Um, what's, what's their no normal color? Normally they're a brown color. They have a little bit of a hint of a rusty red color in there too. but. Um, the albinos are quite striking in their color. Yeah. Let's and this get your head around here. Hello. Oh, that's okay. Do not get too close. <laughs> I got her. And her eyes are red, like yeah, or reddish. Yeah, they're red. Uh, albinos uh, have a lack of melanin, so their eyes just turn red or pink. Oh, oh I'm gonna drop her. Oh my god. Got her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, good. I'm good. I'm good. Don't worry. <laughs> Let me wow. So, so what does she eat? <laughs> She's eating rabbits. Uh, she's eating frozen thawed rabbits. We feed all our snakes frozen thawed meals because it's safer for them and it's uh, more sanitary for us as well. And does she bite? Anything with a mouth can bite. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> it's um, our motto, um, but she's never bitten anyone. She's actually very friendly and I think because of her size, she feels like she doesn't need to bite anyone. Um, she's just so big. Um, so in the wild, how does she, um, what does she eat? And... Uh, they eat, you know, rodents. Um, they actually, all snakes are pretty much gonna eat whatever they can find. So uh, if it's already dead, they'll eat it. Um, that's what most people think. They're, they just hunt all the time. And a uh, majority of them are actually uh, pretty opportunistic. So she'll eat whatever she comes across, um, but they can eat when they get bigger, you know, small deer, pigs. That sort of thing. And so, how often do they? Um, as they get larger, they can go uh, weeks or months without food. So Paula Dean gets fed like every three to four weeks, wow. and that's it. Just, Their metabolisms just slow down quite a bit when they get this large. 
And uh, they are, they're constrictor snakes. Yes, she's a constrictor. So, so if she were to catch an animal live, she would She would constrict it. it, yes. And actually, she still constricts her frozen thawed prey just to hold on to it more I think so. she's constricting my arm. Yeah, she's trying to hold on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Um, All right. Okay. No, it, and it, but this is not, definitely not like that kind of constriction. It's, okay. it's very powerful. She's a very powerful animal. Yeah. But she's very used to people. In fact, she just got done doing Renaissance Festival for two days and had over a hundred children pet her. Wow. So she's very used to people. <laughs> she's a sweetie. Oh my gosh. Wow, I can't believe I'm holding this animal. Yeah. Yeah, she's pretty incredible, isn't she? She is amazing. Reptiles are amazing. Well, thanks so much for sharing your home and all your animals with me. Yeah, no problem. So we've learned all about reptiles, and we're here now to learn about one of my favorite animals, amphibians. So we came to the Atlanta Botanical Garden where I'm gonna to talk to some conservation and amphibian scientists to hear all about these awesome creatures. The Atlanta Botanical Garden's mission is to develop and maintain plant collections for the purpose of display, education, research, and conservation, as well as maintain animal life. One such conservation is the frog pod. I met with Brad Wilson, who is a conservation scientist, kind of like a vet for amphibians. Hi, Brad. It's nice to finally meet you. I'm Mesa. Hi, Mesa. Glad to meet you. Glad you could come and join us today. Oh, I'm so excited. You look right at home here. Where are we? Well, we're at the Atlanta Botanical Garden, and uh, this is a place where I've worked as a volunteer since the mid-1990s, and now I work one day a week as a conservation scientist uh, and provide primarily veterinary care for the amphibians. Oh, cool. And what amphibians are we looking at here? So we have here the uh, Phyllobates terribilis, which is uh, known as one of the most toxic animals in the world. It's actually the one frog that was documented to be used by native tribes in Colombia for killing monkeys. They would actually tip their darts with the poison from the back of the frog. But they're so cute. Yep, yep, <laughs> they, they are. And what's interesting is that in captivity on the native, on, uh, when they're off of their native diet, they actually lose those toxins because studies have shown that they actually sequester toxins from insects in the wild. And when they're on a fruit fly or a cricket diet, they don't have those toxins anymore. Oh, great. So we can touch these guys as well. You can. Maybe That's not right. me, but. <laughs> uh, for the safety of the animal, we usually, if we do touch them, we use gloves on our hands so we don't hurt them in any way. But yes, it would be safe to touch and would not hurt us in any way. Well, I'm so excited to see all of the different animals that you have here. Can you take me on a little tour? Absolutely. Glad you could join us. Great. Okay. Where are we? So we're here in the uh, frog pod. This is our uh, conservation center at the Atlanta Town Garden for Amphibians. And this, all of these cages are filled with frogs? Oh, I see one right there. Yes, yes. So we have uh, about five different species here in the frog pod that are of high conservation value from Panama. And uh, the founder animals of these species here were actually imported from Panama in 2006. And uh, your conservation efforts are geared towards getting them back towards Panama? Well, that was the original plan. Unfortunately, the reason the animals were brought here initially was the fact that we were seeing a lot of frogs going extinct, populations that were dying very quickly. So as an emergency response, the Atlanta Botanical Garden, Zoo Atlanta, and Southern Illinois University partnered to uh, capture animals in the wild, bring them to the United States to safeguard. And then ultimately the goal was to take them back and we are making some efforts now to possibly do that with Smithsonian Institution. Okay, so you raise these guys from little tadpoles? That's right. Most of what you're seeing here are all frogs that are what we call F1 or F2, meaning that they're first or second generation in captivity from the founder animals. Oh, that's great. So they've uh, been around for a while. Exactly. And, and we do still have some founder animals that are approximately 10 to 11 years old. And now what's the difference between a frog and a toad? So the main difference is the skin uh, consistency in a frog. You'll notice mostly that the skin is smooth. Toads tend to have a little bit more rough skin. And in general, from a lifestyle or physiology, the toads are able to wander a little farther from water than frogs are. Okay, and is this, this is all frogs here? This is all frogs in this room. We do have some toads from Panama that we may see a little bit later. Okay, and uh, how about, so frogs and toads are amphibians. Correct. And what makes them different than a reptile? So all amphibians are dependent on water at some point in their lifespan. And for the most part, though there are some exceptions, most frogs have to lay their eggs in water and they have a tadpole phase that, uh, that is aquatic and then they metamorphose into a terrestrial phase or in some cases remain aquatic. There are, however, a few species of frogs that are able to lay eggs on land and the tadpoles never go through an aquatic stage. Oh. 
A quick word on tadpoles, or also known as polywogs. The word coming from Middle English meaning paw, head, and wigglin, to wiggle. Most of them live in water and breed through gills. The process of full maturation can take anywhere from six to eight weeks, while other species may take as long as eight months. And th this, he looks like he's asleep. Yeah, he's asleep now because the, all the frogs we have here are nocturnal, as you notice. Uh, in the southeastern United States, most in the United States, we have most of our frogs are nocturnal, so really? they sleep during the day, and then they're croaking at night. So, oh yeah, you're all, right. <laughs> all of these animals are sleeping now, and uh, they'll actually wake up in a few hours, as we have our timing set so that the uh, middle of the afternoon the lights go out and they come awake, so we can actually watch them before our our workday ends. And they, what what do they eat? Uh, they eat insects. All of the animals we have Ooh, here are exclu little, exclusively insectivores. <laughs> and uh, we feed them a combination of crickets and actually a sub couple species of roaches. And they'll chase them down? That's right, that's right. When they're asleep, they won't. And that's the reason we want to wake them up before we leave for the day so we can feed them. They wake up, they're able to eat, and the insects aren't crawling around the and cage during the day. Do they really do the, to catch They do, that? they do. So <laughs> most of the frogs that we have here will use their tongue to actually prehend food. And uh, some of our smaller frogs may eat fruit flies, but the tongue is relative size of the frog, and most, most of the frogs, the smaller they are, the smaller the food items. Okay. And can we actually, I know he's asleep, but yes, can, we, yes. can we take a closer we look? We do commonly get them out to okay. examine them. This is obviously a good time to examine because they are fairly still. So what we're going to do is get some gloves. Okay. And I'll get some gloves for you as well. Thank you. One amazing little frog is the glass frog, which you can actually see through. Okay. So here we have a couple species of glass frog. This is the one called Cochranella eutnamos. I'm going to see if we can get one up against the glass oh my to look at more Whoa, closely. Oh, he's jumpy. We have to be real delicate with them because as their name yeah. implies, they are a delicate frog. But and they're see-through. You can see through them, that's right. That's incredible. And what's interesting, you'll notice a little bit of a blue coloration. Their blood is actually a bluish green color. They're very, very interesting animals. And we don't, a lot of things we don't understand about the species. Wow, where are these guys from? These are from Panama as well. And they're actually distributed throughout the tropics of the New World, so South America and Central America. And one more interesting thing about these is their tadpoles actually will stay as tadpoles for approximately uh, 300 to 300 days to a year, so they're very, very long wow. tadpoles. So you've got quite a wide variety of frogs here. Exactly. Any and we others? Have, we have one last species that's of uh, big interest, and that's the marsupial frog, which we're going to look at next. Next we have the uh, marsupial frog, and this is the uh, horned marsupial frog. The scientific name is Gastrotheca cornuda. Whoa, he's got really long legs he, and horns. He does. And oh my this gosh. is this is a known is he male. Gonna jump? He Ooh. should sit still, though sometimes they will jump. You're doing well with him. That's great. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. He's he's found a comfortable spot. He might okay. come back to me here. So he's doing real well there. I'll okay. I'll keep watch on him okay. while we talk. Okay. So what's interesting about this species of frog is that this frog has tadpoles that actually develop inside the egg. The male and the female lay eggs. The, the eggs are placed in a pouch on the back of the female's back. And then they go through what's called direct development over about two to three months. And then in, um, fully formed froglets come out of the female's pouch just like a kangaroo. So they're oh, very wow. interesting. So hence the name marsupial. That's right. And, and is, the horns. This, these right. horns are crazy. Why that's do they have right. horns? We don't really know. We think it's probably to help with their camouflage in the wild, but nobody understands all of the little intricacies of their morphology. Wow, he must be a... These legs are so long in the back. They are. It helps him to climb and helps him to jump. Yeah, really. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and place okay, him Okay, yeah, back. let's put him back before he And what's interesting right. is we've actually trained this frog and some other of our individuals to actually eat out of tongs so they can be tongue fed and uh, we can hold a cricket in tweezers and actually feed them directly so we can watch them eat. Cool. The crown tree frog is another species of frog that gets its name from spending a majority of its time in trees. Let's take a closer look. Oh my gosh, so, so you can so tell sweet. he has some oh. sticky toes. This is a frog species that actually lives in tree holes in Panama and they actually wow. breed in tree holes and the females will lay eggs to feed their tadpoles. He's amazing. Yeah. The problem really we have smooth. too is until they breed, we really don't know which, which individuals are males or females. They don't really have any <laughs> external sex characteristics. So 
gets a little difficult to figure out who's the boy and who's the girl. And he's sleepy, so he's not going to jump right. out at me right they, now, right? They rarely will jump in this in this state. When they get more active, they'll be out crawling around. How high can he jump? Um, this frog can jump probably about one to two meters at most. Generally, they are more crawlers than they are jumpers, so we don't see them jump too far. Oh, it's so neat. So, so for sweet. our exam, I'm going to go ahead and transfer him okay. into a little cup that we've prepared. <laughs> oh, his fingers are like, really sticky. They are. He likes to hold on. So this is a specially prepared um, small deli cup, and <laughs> this works really well for us to examine our amphibians and sometimes some small reptiles just because it gives us the ability to visualize the uh, amphibian on all sides. So I can turn him upside down to the side, and I can also just watch normal posture, how breathing is happening without providing the stress of handling. Mm -hmm. So we saw frogs that live in cooler climates, but what about those that can stand a higher temperature? The majority of the world's frog species are found in tropical forests in such places like Panama. Rainforests are considered the oldest ecosystems on Earth. Therefore, rainforest plants and animals continue to evolve and develop amazing coping mechanisms, like we saw with the dart frog and the glass frog. Now, let's check out what it looks like for frogs in a warmer climate. It's a lot warmer in here than it was in the frog pod. It definitely is, and uh, he, our employees say that they don't want to work in here as much as the frog pod because <laughs> the climate control. And one thing we failed to mention was that the frog pod is climate controlled down to about 68 yeah, degrees. Yeah, it felt great. <laughs> Those animals come from higher altitude and require a little bit cooler temperature. And now we're in our what we call the frog lab, which is most of our backup animals for public display. But these are mostly lowland species that can actually handle a wider variety of temperatures and but particularly warm temperatures. So ah. even though we have an air conditioner, we're still 78 to 80 degrees. And I'm seeing that we have some toads in we here. We do, we do. So these these enclosures here actually have some offspring of the evergreen toad, which is uh, Encilius coniferus. That's a toad from Panama. We actually bred those in captivity here at the Atlanta Botanical Garden. And um, I have one here from display if you'd like to see it. Yeah, I would love to. This is an older female. She's retired from breeding now, but we she's very attractive as you can see. So she's a nice green frog. Oh wow. And what's interesting, is this a frog or is this a toad? It's a toad. Okay. And uh, commonly we'll, we might use the, the word frog to describe frogs and toads, but this gives us an exam, uh, opportunity to look at the differences between the warty skin and the little bit drier skin of a toad. Oh, I know. <laughs> now you did a good job here okay. because one of our, our uh, methods of holding is that we'll actually hold the back legs like this to examine uh -huh. the frog. So this is a very, very safe way to hold a frog with the legs extended in the palm of your hand. But you can see the warty skin, they're a little drier, and you'll notice that these toads here are kept in a fairly dry environment compared to our other frogs. Yeah, and they absolutely. don't have any active misting. So I'll go ahead and put her back. Okay, thanks for sharing back. the toads. Our world is amazing from small to big. Creatures come in all shapes and sizes, and it's amazing to think we share this wonderful world with them.